Hey everyone, happy Saturday. I hope you have your breakfast cereal and your Saturday morning cartoons all taken care of. It is in select time, June 30th, 2016, and we're talking about how lighthouses work. Uh, This is a really cool podcast. I remember really enjoying this one um, because I had done some research on lighthouses for a movie script I was writing. So this one was really pretty key for that. So here we go with how lighthouses work. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant and Jerry over there, and this is the Lighthouse episode. Take one. (laughs) Uh, Can I just go ahead and say that I love lighthouses? Do you? Love, 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 love. Already before, like, you fell in love with them researching this? Both. Like, if I'm, I grew up uh, going to Hunting Island, South Carolina, not every year, but we went quite a few times near Beaufort, and they have a lighthouse, Mm -hmm. and it was one of my favorite things to do as a kid, was climb the lighthouse, and I would, if if I'm near a lighthouse now, ever, I will go climb it. The outside? I will seek it out, and then shimmy up the outside (laughs) like (laughs) Spider-Man. Um, no, I will seek it out and go look at it and then climb it. And, um, this article just made me love it even more. I have a precious memories lighthouse too. Ooh, let's hear. Uh, Marblehead lighthouse near Catawba Island. Which is where? What state? By Sandusky in Ohio. Okay. Um, on Lake Erie. Yeah. And it was same thing. When I was a kid, we used to go vacation on Catawba mm-hmm. Island and, um, we would go to that lighthouse every once in a while. I don't remember ever going inside, though. Oh, really? It may not have been open because there's no yeah. reason why you would go to a lighthouse more than once and not go inside, climb it up. Yeah. But I don't remember ever going in. But it, it Or was, maybe you were just like, yeah, well, it looks nice from down here. Yeah. I would have climbed it. I was a climber. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing that factors in for me is I, I found I really love antiquated systems that could still be viable. Yeah. Like post-apocalypse, you could fire up lighthouses again. Sure. With you know? a fire. Yeah, and it would work. Yeah, it would. And I think that's a weird thing with me that I love. I love stuff that's still around that you could use if if need be. Right. You know? I did, I've never else. really looked at my environment that way. Yeah? Like to see what I was going to be standing after an apocalypse. Maybe I should. Well, I don't know about standing, but let's just... Let's say there was some weird domino effect type thing, like that movie where electricity and internet and everything went out. Right. And people turned on each other. You could still light a lighthouse and folks what, could find their safe harbor. What movie are you talking about? The domino effect. Oh, really? There's a movie like that? Called that? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I think it was called with Elizabeth Shue and uh, Agent uh, Mulder. Cooper. Agent Cooper from Twin Peaks. Kyle, uh, what's his face? McLaughlin. Yeah. And he is so great as the mayor in Portlandia. Yeah, he is good. I love that guy. I think it was called the domino effect. All right. If not, that was the, you know, essentially what happened. There was a domino effect. <laughs> like a blackout, right? Yeah, that just like, and it created a domino effect that things kind of spun out of control. You're talking about Fury Road. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh... Chuck, I love lighthouses too, but I knew virtually nothing about them until researching this. Yeah. And um, if you think about them, though, it's like you were saying, after the apocalypse, you'll still, they'll still be standing. You just need to replace the electricity with a fire. And then you'd have basically what lighthouses have always been, which is some sort of highly visible signal. For most of the time, it, it was a fire, either a wood fire, or coal fire, or tar fire. Yeah. Um, that you could see that was meant to signal to ships that, hey, man, there's some treacherous waters around here. Yeah. It's one of the main things that they did. And as the light got better and better, one of the roles that um, lighthouses played was not just to say, careful in this area. We went to the trouble of building a lighthouse here because it's so treacherous. Right. But also, check out these rocks. Yeah. See this with this light? Uh-huh. There's some rocks there. Yeah, like literally lighting up a harbor. Yeah. Um, well, because there was no light otherwise. Right. And then um, the other role that they play is in the daytime, right? Because lighthouses, uh, I don't think that they actually keep them on 
24 hours a day, highly inefficient on a cloudy day. Yeah. If it's foggy, they'll turn it on and mm-hmm. start fo- sounding the fog horns, which we'll talk about. But um, for the most part, in the daytime, it's off. But a lighthouse still serves a purpose during the day because they don't decorate them the way that they decorate them just for looks. Right. They do it so you can differentiate one lighthouse from another. Yeah, like this one looks like a barber pole, so right. I know... I'm near North Carolina's uh, Cape Hatteras. Exactly, right? Yeah. And there's like a whole book called The Light List where it has pictures of them and it Did has... you get your hands on that? No. I meant to look it up, but I ran out of time. I'll bet it's neat. I bet it's neat too. By the way, that movie is called The Trigger Effect. I have heard of that one. There was a movie called The Domino Effect, but it's not the same one. What about The Butterfly Effect? Remember that? <laughs> Garbage. <laughs> that was the cooch, right? Yeah. Man, why does he haunt us? I don't know. He comes up a lot. All right, where were we? Were we in the lighthouse? We were talking about the the day mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty neat. But there's also what's called the um, the light signature, right? Yes. Where that's um that's we're going back to nighttime again. Yeah, yeah. Sorry I to keep reversing. The sun's going up and down. Well, you turn the lights <laughs> off. It got weird. It is a little weird. Yeah. It's all right, Jerry. Are you still here? She's here. So um. At night, the light has its own flashing signature, Uh light signature, and that's also in the light book, too. And there's actually a number of different ways that a light can flash, right? Who knew? I didn't know. Uh, You've got the fixed, and that is, of course, if you just have a light on saying, uh, we're open. Yeah, it shines continuously. Come on in. It's the Waffle House. (laughs) You have the occulting light. I love this one. The creepiest of all lights. Uh, It has longer periods of light than dark. Um, and then and it flashes six, 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 <laughs> uh, and a flashing light has longer periods of dark than light. So occulting and flashing are just sort of inverse of one another. There are two sides of the same coin. That's right. You can't have light without the dark is the whole premise. And then you have the isophase light, uh, that's equal light and dark with its, uh, signature blips. Yeah. And then a group flashing light. Super seventies. Yeah, it has a, a, a regular repeating number of flashing lights. It's the same pattern, right? Yeah, and there's actually a really famous one of those. Um, the Minot's Ledge Light in Boston, mm-hmm. it was very famously known as, I think it still is, the I Love You Light, because it would flash one, then it would flash four, and then it would flash three. So I L O V E Y O U. So it was like a very romantic light. That's how people took it. I didn't make that up. Oh, see, I thought it was was, I hate cow. It could, that's the secondary (laughs) way that it's known. The people in Boston are known for their soft side. (laughs) I know. So that's why they call it the I love you. Yeah. Yeah. They're prone to break into sobs in public on the street (laughs) frequently, just walking around thinking about the beauty of life. Um, And then finally, we have our alternating, uh, I'm sorry, we have the Morse code. which is what it sounds like. It it mimics Morse code with dats and dashes. <laughs> dats and dashes? <laughs> That's Morse <Maersk> code. <laughs> <laughs> dots and dashes? Man. Um, to spell out, you know, things like, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what Minot's ledge does. No. Right, and that's, right. It's not Morse code. It's just... It's just one, four, and three. Yeah, yeah. And people took it that way. I hate cow. <laughs> I mean, those ledge actually is pretty awesome to begin with. It's it's under 10 feet of water at high tide. Whoa. And they had to build it, I think, in the 19th century whenever the tide was out. So they only had like X amount of hours in yeah. a day during low tide when the ledge was exposed. Interesting. But it's still there. It's a tough cookie. Wow. But, Josh, these are all sort of modern. Modern-ish. Yeah, modern-ish. But um, although old, they can go back to uh, what 1200 B.C.? Homer's so, Iliad, they mention a lighthouse. Yeah. Crazy. And I mean, like, we're talking basically a huge bonfire on a cliff. More, yeah, exactly. You know, not like a, well, not like Minot's Ledge or anything, but it no. still qualifies as a lighthouse. It was the, the, the premise behind it. Yeah, exactly. I sounded weirdly defensive just now <laughs> about that. Yeah. It's still a lighthouse. Yeah. Uh, like you said, you would have like either uh, wood or coal burning on a long pole. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, finally, in the 18th century, um, they started using lanterns, uh, which is a little more probably controllable. Yeah. The problem was they they kept running into um, was that the 
oil or coal would smudge the lantern, the glass around the lantern. And the, so the glass top, the whole thing where the light is uh-huh. that you can walk around in, that's the lantern of the lighthouse. Yeah. And if you're burning a coal fire in there, it's going to get sooty pretty quick. Yeah. One of the, that's one of the main jobs of the lighthouse keepers to wash windows. Right. Um, th- the problem is, is in between washings, which they did at least once a day normally. Yeah. Um, the the light would degrade as the soot built up. Right. Uh, so they figured out, oh, we need better, better fuel than coal or tar. Who yeah. thought to use tar? <laughs> Let's burn the dirtiest thing on the planet yeah. well, inside. The, they were working with what they had at the time. So they they figured out, especially in New England, that they could um, use things like uh, blubber and yeah. lard, mm-hmm. which they did. Yeah, from whales. Burns a lot cleaner. Uh, and then they also figured out, hey, you know what? This flame is okay, but wouldn't it be great um, pre-electricity if we had something like electricity yeah. to beam this thing out there for miles and miles? Yeah. And a very smart physicist from France named Augustine Fresnel. Fresnel. I like Fresnel. That's cool. <laughs> Fresnel said, all right, take my lens and do with it what you will. <laughs> And he invented the Fresnel lens. He did. In 19, I'm sorry, 1822. And uh, it's like what you would think it would be. It's a bunch of prisms um, th- that through magic can cast a beam like 20-something miles out to the ocean. Yeah. It's amazing. They concentrate in the, they gather light from the top and the bottom mm-hmm. and in the middle and basically just shoot it all back to a single magnifying point. Amazing. That just goes pew, 28 miles. Yeah. That's a long At the way. Max. Yeah. Yeah. And that really, that changed everything and did a great job of, of uh, handling the load until electricity would come around. And that's when everyone was like, you know what? We don't need these silly flames anymore. Let's just plug in a light. But you can still use a Fresnel lens with the light and it's even brighter well, now. that's true. Like today's modern lighthouses use um, or have produced lights between 10,000 candelas in a million candelas. What's a candela? D- did you <laughs> see this reference? Like, this is the worst analogy I've ever run across. Uh, what What'd it say? A candela is one two hundredth the brightness of a 50-watt light bulb. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. I know exactly how much a candela is. I also saw that it's roughly the uh, brightness of a candle, which makes sense. And that's a much yeah. better frame of reference. So uh, the brightness of a million candles burning in the same place. Right. That's how bright modern lighthouses are. Okay. Not one two hundredth of yeah. a 50 watt bulb. Let's take a break. Yeah, seriously. Let's go find out who wrote that and write a strongly worded letter. Okay. That got ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're. St- I, I feel like we're still talking about the history of lighthouses, right? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it, what the, were they? They were made of wood early on. Um, yeah. But the problem with a wooden lighthouse and a massive <laughs> burning fire of tar yeah. is that they can burn down and be washed out to sea, or in rough weather can just be knocked plumb over yeah. by waves. And uh, but, like I said, they use what they had at the time and. Over the years, they got sturdier and sturdier with steel and concrete and stuff like that. Well, even over, even before over the years. Uh, before over the years? Yeah, Pharos <laughs> at Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was this um, lighthouse at the mouth of the harbor to Alexandria, Egypt, right? Yeah. And it was around, I'm not quite sure when it was around. I think the... F- Which one? The Pharos of Alexandria. 270 B.C., my friend. That thing was pretty sturdy. It took a massive earthquake to bring it down. Yeah. It was made of masonry. It wasn't made of wood, you know? Yeah. So it looks like lighthouse construction got dumber as the years went on. And then it got smart again. Then it got smart again. It just dipped down in the wood era and then came back up. (laughs) Well, um, what you you normally have is the lighthouse, which can be just a lighthouse, or there might be... uh, a fog signal building. There might be a boathouse. You might have a little house or apartment attached to it. You're right. And you might live there with your family on in a very remote part of the world. Um, 
all by yourself. Or with a couple of other dudes. Yeah, and take turns and take shifts. That's called a stag station. Yeah, and I think the other thing that appeals to me about lighthouses is I could have lived that life. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I can have seen myself dropping out. and You got a neck beard? Yeah. All Just you need is like a cable net sweater and... Living up there all by myself, a corn cob pipe. Really? Yeah, grow my own crops and just sit up there and be quiet. Huh. No one bugging me. <laughs> it's like, it appeals. Wow. I did uh, not know that. I did not picture you as a lighthouse keeper. I, I could totally do it. Or a light keeper for short. Um, and... Um, this is another thing that I thought was remarkable in this article. We might as well mention it. Is that if there is a lighthouse near you that nobody operates, it is possible that you could own that lighthouse. Yeah. Um, For $1. The National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000, it uh, got a process together where the Coast Guard, which is what runs uh, the lighthouse biz now right the lighthouse racket um they you can basically start a nonprofit or have a nonprofit, and at no cost they will give you a decommissioned lighthouse if you maintain it and keep it open to the public yeah for the most part it's uh like preservation societies yeah, who are handling sure. this but if nobody wants it they put it up for auction yeah and then you can do what you want to i can live out my dream yeah. And I wouldn't have to do the windows either. I could just live up there and be a crusty old hermit. Right. You know? We could do a Kickstarter to help you live out your dream, Chuck. <laughs> well, I have a family let's, now. Let's That'd do a few cool. more years of stuff you should know first, though, before you go. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Um, all right. So back to more modern times. Um, we're building them out of concrete and steel at this point. They're a little more sturdy. You got your little keeper's house. You're not getting paid much money. How much money? Dude, it, not much. So this article says that they earned about $200 annually in the late 19th century. I went on to the gee whiz West Egg inflation calculator. Mm-hmm. For eight, in 1890, that was five grand today. Your provisions are covered though, right? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, at the very least, your room is... I don't know I about imagine, board. I bet you they... they All the whale you. lard you can eat. Yeah. <laughs> no, I imagine they take care of stuff because you can't, like, leave and go shopping. Like, imagine you just have everything shipped to you. Yeah. And, um, again, ideal. I love that. Don't have to go out. You don't have to spend any money. It's you're like just, web van yeah. coming to you. You're, just, you're banking that five five grand a year, essentially. Wow, man. When you get into like lighthouse mode, you're lowering the the standards like tremendously. <laughs> like, you're like, man, I'm making five grand. People are bringing me food. I don't have to talk to anybody. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it's like your fantasy. Mm-hmm. That's hilarious. Um, so the the that lens we were talking about, we we didn't use that in the United States for a while because the way I read this is we kind of cheaped out. Yeah. Uh, when it was being run. Um, by this guy Stephen Pleasant from for 30 years, 1820 to 1852, uh, 32 years he ran a, a, an efficient, some might say chintzy program, yeah. to where he was like, you know, we don't need those fancy French lenses. Um, take these cruddy versions. They probably wouldn't even a lens, just like a mirror reflector or something. If that, yeah. Maybe a piece of metal that somebody had to just stand behind the light with to reflect it. <laughs> You're my mute assistant. <laughs> right. Be quiet. Uh, but then finally the U.S. government got involved and they said, you know what, we need to regulate this. Well, no, the U.S., it. they were involved. That's when oh, it that's became right. chintzy. Yes, from 1716 to 1789 that was not run by the U.S. government. No, it wasn't until Alexander Hamilton almost got in a shipwreck yeah. off the coast of, uh, I think, North Carolina, and he went back and said, hey, I think we need some lighthouses. The federal government needs to get involved. Yeah. And so I think the 19th piece of legislation the U.S. Congress ever passed was to establish the um, Lighthouse Board. Uh, the U.S. Lighthouse Establishment, initially, is what it was called. Okay. And, you know, socialist program. <laughs> he said that the federal, the federalities are going to run this thing. Right. 
Uh, and We're they in did. charge now. And you know what? Things um, went downhill. It yeah. <laughs> improved, improved everyone who's critical of big government right. Yeah, but there were a lot of lighthouses at the time. Uh, by 1900, we had a, about 1,000 lighthouses. Well, and by 1900, the uh, government had reformed its reputation. Like, seriously, the world round for the mid-19th century, the U.S. Gov- the U.S. lighthouse system was second rate at best. Yes. It, it just had a terrible reputation. And I guess it sounds like they got rid of uh, Stephen Pleasant whose name is basically Mud these days, and the, the quality went up. Yeah, and that's when they established the Lighthouse Board, which is, I think, what you were thinking, yeah. to, to shape things up in 1852. They said, let's get some Fresnel lenses for all these lighthouses. Right. Finally. Yeah. We can be like the rest of the world. Pleasant's dead. <laughs> uh, did you know the Statue of Liberty was a lighthouse? I don't know if I knew it, but when I read it, I'm like, well, yeah. But I don't know if it unlocked right. some memory or yeah. if I'm just like, well, that's just too obvious Same thing for me to admit to me. I didn't know. Yeah, I was like, oh, surely I knew that, right? Right. That's yeah, what that's, I thought. That was it. Uh, for 15 years, it was a lighthouse in uh, New York Harbor. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, and then by 1930, when electricity was effective and rampant, um, you didn't need these fires burning or candles burning or whale blubber. No, but there were a lot of lighthouses where that were on like islands or on offshore like ledges like Minot's Ledge or Eddystone in England uh-huh. um, that were just like we, the technology to run electricity out there just was not around. Yeah, of course. Um, so they were still using oil of various types to to fuel these things well into the 20th century, into the 60s, um, easily. Yeah, and they were um, still had people working there, um, living uh, in the lighthouse or on the property. Yeah. Uh, into the 1960s, it was definitely more rare, but um, in ni- uh, that's when the Coast Guard uh, brought about their lighthouse automation and modernization program, and that pretty much dwindled. By the end of that decade, it dwindled it down to 60 that still had people working there. Oh, really? Yeah, well, 60 out of 1,000. Today, there's one in Boston, the Brewster Island one. Little Brewster Island. Little Brewster Island. I Is was there, confusing it with Big Brewster. Well, there might be one. Brewster's Millions Island. <laughs> uh, Little Brewster. That's right. It was the first one in the United States. Uh, 1716 was when it was built, and then that one was replaced in 1783, and it's the second oldest working one behind Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Huh. And the person that lives there is basically living there as a tour guide, not necessarily like guiding boats into harbor. Is Although they may do both. No, I think it's still working, yeah. yeah well, then I guess they do both. They do I double saw, duty. I saw Modern Marvels on Lighthouses, and they interviewed one of the light keepers on Brewster Island, Little Brewster Island, and he... He was. They showed him like polishing the glass and everything. Yeah, but it's automated. I got you. the light itself. I see. I see. So they they upkeep and tour guide it. Right. I think. Okay. But yeah, he's still. I mean, he's providing a function there. So yeah. Absolutely. It's not just show. Maybe I could. That's what I could do then. There you go. You should have heard that guy. He's like, I can't even begin to do it. But he was like a hardcore light keeper oh, really? in Boston. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Although I wouldn't be the best person because. Chuck's silent lighthouse tour isn't really up. <laughs> you just like, you just sweep your arm in a just room and turn out. and quietly leave. People ask questions. I just wrap them on the knuckles. <laughs> out. All right. I'm getting all excited thinking about the prospects of living in a lighthouse. So I'm going to go do some push ups. Okay. And we'll come back right after this. So, Chuck, say that you uh, did live your life as a light keeper. What would you? What would it be like? Mm. First of all, what's Peaceful. your what's your family background? Uh, well, my dad was a fisherman. Probably. Uh, actually, my my great great grandfather was a fisherman. My grandfather was a light keeper. My dad was a son of a light keeper, and your I'm a son mom of a son was of a, a light keeper. Pirate captain. Pirate captain. Like Gina Davis. Yeah. That was a good movie. 
She's awesome. Yeah. She, uh, Jesse Thorne interviewed her recently on his Bullseye show. Mm-hmm. She's just like the best. Yeah. And, heard, and they were she, all excited uh, in the office. Everyone was like, oh, man, Gina Davis is the coolest. She uh, supposedly was known for bringing cookies for, to, that she baked herself to interviews. Really? Yeah. She's a Mensa member. Yeah. Got a lot going on there. Julia Smith, who works at the Max Fun HQ and produces Judge Don Hodgman, mm-hmm. said uh, on her Facebook, she was like, Gina Davis is like the coolest aunt of all cool ants oh, of cool. all time. Yeah. I thought she was in Beetlejuice. I mean, like... Yeah, it doesn't get much cooler than that. She could she could just be a total jerk, and she was still awesome in Beetlejuice. Yeah. Um, so anyway, hats off to you, Gina Davis. <laughs> How'd that come up? I don't even remember now. Your mom was a pirate captain. All right, Gina Davis. Was that a shout-out to Cutthroat Island? I guess. The movie? Yeah. You're the one that said it. I, I guess it was, yeah. Was that... Cutthroat Island, huh? Is it the name of it? Yeah, it was that bad pirate movie she made. I loved it. <laughs> that wasn't bad. It, it's, it got bad press. It wasn't bad. <laughs> it's funny. You like some of the most legendarily bad movies of all time. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. As far as just like critics and you're like, yeah, man, Ishtar. I never One, saw Ishtar. Wonderful movie. <laughs> I've actually stayed away from Ishtar. I also stayed away from Rock the Casbah because I saw that it was basically an updated Ishtar. Did I even see that? I can't remember if I watched it one night. Rock the Casbah? Yeah, or if I wanted to and didn't. Like, that's how little of an impact it made. It's on Netflix. I think I actually did watch it, and it was just sort of like, eh, yeah. not very good. Yeah, no, Ishtar is a pretty good code word to stay away from a yeah. movie. I never saw Ishtar. What else do I like that was bad? Or supposedly <clears throat> bad? I mean, like, I'll just, have, I'll... You, have you seen Cutthroat Island? Uh, Sure. It, it, terrible. It's not that bad. <laughs> it's terrible. Okay. Um, all right. So we were talking about the lineage, what might get you into the light keeping business. Uh, we were being coy and role playing, but that is true. People, it's a family business for the most part. Yeah. Uh, your parents or your father might have done it, um, or you come from a long line of uh, seafaring types. Yeah. At the very least. Yeah. You feel close to the sea. Yeah. Like if you want to spend your time out there on a rocky point overlooking the waves all day long like you probably didn't come from kansas to do so you know yeah they're they have uh wheat watchers <laughs> they just sit in the tower and watch the wheat yeah and the flatness and they stand up all of a sudden they're like oh my god there's a wheat missing <laughs> there's a wheat uh-huh. <laughs> um one thing we keep saying is men. Yeah. That's because uh, most of the lighthouse keepers were men, but not all. No, not all. And not all of them were necessarily white men either. There were some very famous uh, legendary African-American light keepers yeah. too. And um, light s- life savers as well. Surf men is what they were called too. Yeah, um, because supposedly you're just there to provide light right. and signal. But when the S hits the F... right. Um, I think you can say a fan. Fan. Right. <laughs> when the S hits the fan, brave light keepers were known to go out there and provide rescue. Yeah. Um, and one of them was a woman named Ida Lewis, actually. American hero. She grew up on Lime Rock Island mm-hmm. uh, n- n- near Newport, Rhode Island in Newport Harbor. And her dad was a light keeper. So she followed that tradition. Yep. And she actually started taking over the duties after her father had a stroke. Um, and... Uh, she just became a light keeper, but a very famous one for her life-saving skills. Yeah, rescued a dozen men over the years? No, actually, 18 oh, confirmed. Oh, really? They think it's as high as 25. Then I'm going to say dozens. She, uh, she rescued her last person at age 63. Wow. Yeah, she was quite a lady. Yeah, that's spunk. But for the most part... And and she's not the only one who saved lives. Like there were plenty out there that did, but it was not a, a an expected role of a light keeper, right? Because the Coast Guard had a lifesaver house, usually nearby yeah. a uh, lighthouse, yeah. because the lighthouse was there in the first place to because that was a treacherous area. So it would just make sense to also put a life saving house there because even with the light the lighthouse itself. A uh, ship may still run aground, and sure. there may be rescuing. And if you want to be thrilled, there's a really neat um, article that's posted on this podcast page about the Pea Island um, life-saving 
house. Oh, really? It was, um, the, by, think, by the way, the pre-Coast Guard, we had the U.S. Life Saving Service. Right. Which is what that term comes from. Yeah, and then they merged everything together um, under Roosevelt. Yeah, 1939. And the, the lighthouses and the Life Saving Service all came under the purview of the Coast Guard. Right. Right? Yeah. We should do one on the Coast Guard. Sure. Remember that married couple that were both Coast Guarders? Oh, yeah. That lobbied us for many years until they gave up? Yep. Uh, we're still thinking about you guys, and we're still going to do a Coast Guard podcast. Don't worry. <laughs> Eventually. Years and years later. Um, so pre-1939, when they made the Coast Guard, is uh, where you really can't find a whole lot of written history yeah. now. A lot of that has been lost to time. And um, they say here in this article that what we have now are stories from families that remain. Lore. Yeah, lore. It's pretty neat. Yeah. And then, Chuck, um, so if you're in a lighthouse, yeah. even as remote and cut off as they are, mm-hmm. if you hated it, you would still be like, at least I'm not working on a light ship. Yes. So before they had buoys, like modern buoys today, there's, there's buoys out there. Mm-hmm. They're basically like floating lighthouses in areas that require some sort of warning but are just too far off land to um, build a lighthouse. They put buoys out there. Yeah. And today the buoys are like sometimes something like 40 feet in diameter. They're huge, yeah. massive things. Yeah. Um, but before buoys even, they would use something called light ships. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a lighthouse on a ship. Mm-hmm. And it's in a very remote area. You are out there for... Months at a time? Yeah, you just sail out and anchor down and live there. Right. Um, and the boat's anchored all the time. You would have to, like, go to and from yeah. the boat to the to shore. Um, but while you're working there, it's just mind-bogglingly awful. Yeah. I bet there was a lot of, like, insanity Yeah, that would happen. Like, when the fog rolled in, before the advent of foghorns, you would have to yank the, the bell's rope, the fog bell rope, mm-hmm. Um Every 10 seconds, 24 hours a day for as long as the fog was around. Crazy. Every 10 seconds, you had to ring a bell. That was your job. And if you didn't, then you were risking the lives of anybody passing by in the area. So not cool, man. Not cool at all. No. no. But the light ships apparently were just about as bad as it, it got as far as boredom, loneliness, isolation, hatred of bells. The light ship had it all. You hate bells? I didn't. I never worked on a light ship. Oh, right. But I'll bet they hated bells. Yeah, it's loud. You would hear that in your sleep. If you rang Mm -hmm. a bell every 10 seconds for hours at a stretch, you're not going to get that out of your head. And even if you did, when you tried to go to sleep, one of the guys on the next shift would be out there ringing the bell anyway. So Yeah, drive you nuts. So let's talk about some famous lighthouses. Uh, Well, we already talked about the, uh, the pharaohs of Alexandria. Mm-hmm. Um, which is the oldest known lighthouse. And at the time, they contend might have been the tallest thing on the planet. Yeah. At 450 feet. That's super tall. Yeah, and it was masonry, too. They found it in 1994 underwater. Yeah, at the bottom of the ocean. They found pieces of it in, mm-hmm. in Alexandria Harbor, I guess. Uh, you mentioned Eddie Stone Light already in Plymouth, England, which is, I guess that's where the fine gin comes from. Yeah. Still hitting Plymouth up. If anyone out there works for Plymouth. Oh, man, it's such good gin. It's delicious. So is Leopold's. Leopold's gin? Yeah, it's American gin. It's oh, really? Really good, too. Is it good? That's, that's my go-to American gin. Nice. Although I like most American gins, but that's pretty yeah. good. Have you had uh, St. George? I love that stuff. Yeah, there's three of them. One of them I do not care for at all. Really? But the other two I like. I'll bet it's the Terra Terroir you don't like. It's a, got a weird taste. Yeah, but... People love it, but I, I don't appreciate it. It's its it. own thing. It is its own thing. The fact that it doesn't have its own classification of gin, like Old Tom or Jennifer or something yeah, like yeah. that, it should have its own thing. Yeah, like foot gin. I love that stuff. <laughs> it tastes weird. Dude, me? it's really good. You know what it's really good with? Have you ever had um, Fever Tree Bitter Lemon? No. It's like a, a lemony, lemon-limey, citrusy drink, but without much sweetness. Mm-hmm. Um, that with the uh, Terra Terroir. Gin and juice. Yeah. You know? But it's, it'll, Fancy gin it'll and juice. knock your socks off. 
yeah, I don't care for it. And you know what? I'll just go ahead and bring you my bottle because oh, okay. I've had like two drinks out of it. I okay. tried to wrap my head around it I will take and I it. just can't do it. I will email you tonight as a reminder yeah. to say, hey. I'll bring in that St. George. Thanks, um, man. And also, by the way, I am now on, because you know I drink the dirty martini, but I don't eat olives, which is a little weird. Um, you just like the juice? Yeah. Huh. The brine. Okay. Um, with a twist. It's a little different. Oh, I know. I've, I've had that. And um, for years, I would have uh, emptied jars of dry olives in my <laughs> fridge and very little juice, you know, is in there. Oh, I know what you're talking about now. So now I bought Dirty Sue yeah. olive juice. Uh-huh. And you can buy it in a bottle. And I bought a box of it, and it just sits in the cabinet in my house. Nice. And uh, so big shout out to Dirty Sue olive brine. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Really dirties up your martini. What's your gin that you use for this? Well, I mean, I love Plymouth. Uh-huh. I love Hendrix. And uh, our friends at Spring 44 Gin Dude. sent us gin from a... They said it's all about the water, yeah. and they have, like, the best water on earth. They made some Old Tom gin. Yeah. And it is, uh, it is delicious. Yeah. Like, it, it made... I love Martinez's. Uh-huh. It's um, Old Tom gin... Uh, um, maraschino liqueur, mm-hmm. not the cherry stuff, but like the real liqueur. Yeah, and then um, some sweet vermouth. Yes, it's like probably the the most perfect drink anyone's ever made. And it's very old. Um, but that made maybe the best Martinez I've ever had. That was good stuff. Well, for a while lately, I've been stirring. I got a little martini pitcher or mm-hmm. a cocktail pitcher. Yeah, yeah. to stir. Yeah, um, but I'm back to shaking now because I found out that bruising gin is a total myth. Oh, so James Bond wasn't cuckoo? No, you can't bruise gin. Yeah. That's all just garbage. Do you uh, use orange bitters in yours? No. Really brightens it up. Straight up Dirty Sue gin. <laughs> uh, I do use a little vermouth. Like, I know that people yeah. don't like vermouth at all anymore. Oh, I really? Yeah, I see bartenders now don't even use any vermouth. You, that's, that's not a martini. Well, agreed. That's a, a gin, a chilled gin up. With some yeah. olive brine. What so kind dry. of vermouth do you use? Um, just the the one in the green Italian bottle. Was that Dolan Blanc? Yeah, that's good stuff. But I also found out recently that that vermouth is a wine, mm-hmm. and you don't just keep it on your shelf for two years. No, uh, you keep it in the fridge for maybe a month. Yeah, didn't know that. So I've been drinking this old old vermouth. It, you still can. It's not like you can't. But just yeah. for the the best possible impact. Uh huh. You want to just get that small bottle. Yeah. So I learned that the hard way yeah, too. Yeah, I'm going to start doing that. Man, we we should have our own cocktail show. <laughs> we should. Because we've just talked, to, we talk about booze a lot. I yeah, feel we like. don't need to. Let's Drink About It has that covered. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Our good friends at Let's Drink About It. Yeah, and thanks also to Ben who sent us um, some Ambler, Bourbon. Smooth Ambler. Uh, what was it called? Contradiction. That stuff is good, too. That's right. Man, booze talk on lighthouses. Who knew? Oh, I bet you there's a lot of booze in that goes on at lighthouses. <laughs> I'll bet, too. This ties but I'll in bet nicely. they're not making amazing drinks with St. George and bitter lemon. No. They're just drinking that stuff straight out of the deer skin. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, where were we? Eddie Stone Lighthouse, Plymouth, England. Oh, That's yeah. That's how this yeah. got started. Um this thing is, it's a, it's a very rough area to have a lighthouse, and it seems like nature doesn't want a lighthouse there because over the years it has been knocked down and burned down many, many times. Yeah. This dude basically um, went out there by himself, Harry, Harry, or Henry Winstanley, yeah. in 1660, 1696, yeah. and just started building this wooden lighthouse out in these rocks off the coast of Plymouth mm-hmm. himself, got captured by a French pirate, yeah. released... And uh, lit the thing in 1698. And he actually died. He deconstructed it and rebuilt it and died in the second version of it. Oh, really? It got swept away with him inside. Okay, but he was so a pretty cool cat. That was 1703. Then another one in 1708 was built. Mm-hmm. That burned down in 1755. And then a guy named John Smeaton, he was an engineer, he built one that was built to last for a little while. <laughs> he actually came up with what you think of as the modern lighthouse. It's oh, really? thick at the bottom, uh-huh. tapers at the top, and then it flares out right below the lantern. Right. And the reason most lighthouses flare out right below the lantern is when a wave comes up and the waves can get that big. Sure. It won't ride up into the lantern. It will be f- thrown back out to sea when it hits the flare. Oh, it's a water guard. Pretty much. Interesting. Yeah. Did not know that. 
He was a smart dude. Um, so that one lasted for 123 years, which was, a, a, you know, as far as the Eddystone light is concerned, an eternity. But eventually, uh, the Trinity House, which is England's version of the Coast Guard. Of the Lighthouse Establishment. The Lighthouse Establishment. Yeah. They said, no, let's, let's tear that thing down it's t- <laughs> in 1882. It stood up this long, but <laughs> we think it might not for much longer. But then they built another one. This one, actually, they, they used almost a jigsaw. Yeah. Puzzle the, for the, one the, that's still for the there foundation. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So when a wave hits it, it actually compresses together and becomes stronger oh. when a wave's smacking into it. So Pretty that was smart. there for good. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we talked about Boston Light. Uh, there's also the Cape Hatteras uh, on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which is, I believe, the tallest one in the United States. It's yeah. It's 208 feet. And it's one of the most famous as well. It's the one with the black and white barber pole yeah, it's very design. Cool. Yeah, That's 63 meters for our friends everywhere else in the world. Did you know that that one was in trouble? The sea was encroaching upon it, and they got some money together, Congress did, and moved it, moved this lighthouse 2,300, 2,900 feet back inland. Yeah. Over the course of 23 days, they slowly moved it on tracks. Wow. It was pretty amazing. It was on that Modern Marvels one. It's like Fitzcarraldo. Sure. <laughs> um, I got a few more fast facts unless you have something else. No, I'm, I'm done. Uh, 680 lighthouses remaining in the U.S. estimated uh, out of that original 1,000 plus. 37 states have lighthouses. Just not Kansas. Not Kansas. Michigan has the most, don't they, of all the states? Yeah, 120 in Michigan. Because of the Great Lakes. I would imagine. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the East Coast has 391. West Coast only has 94. Hmm. Uh, I guess there's just a lot more shipping and stuff, huh? On the Need East. to step it up, West Coast. Um, and worldwide, uh, we estimate seven, more than 17,000 lighthouses in 250 countries. Hmm. And the brightest one, Oak Island in North Carolina, 14 million candle power. You can see it from Whoa. 24 miles. Wow. Isn't that great? Yeah, that's a lot. 14 million candles all burning at once. Pretty neat. Sounds like a new religion. The candelas. Really? A million is one lighting their candle. <laughs> I think you just established it. Reciting the... Uh, the candela's prayer. Mm-hmm. Nice. See? We just started a religion. Yeah. That easy. Well, you did. I just bore witness. That's all right. You can be my faithful assistant. Thanks. Can I baptize you? Sure. Okay. Uh, If you want to know more about lighthouses, you can type that word into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I talked about baptizing Chuck, it's time for Listener Mail. Uh, Since you talked about baptizing Chuck, that must mean it's 1984. (laughs) Uh, Hey, guys, I recently (laughs) discovered your podcast and immediately fell in love. I'm thirsty for knowledge find it quite impressive that you've become quasi-experts. Mm. Not really. Yeah. But I'm writing in to respond to the controlled burn episode. Uh, I used to work for my local county park system doing habitat and wildlife management, and controlled burns took up many days in the early spring for us. Our department only consisted of about six to seven people, three of which were licensed burn bosses nice. uh, by the state. Uh, they make the burn plan, they light the fire, and basically coordinate and oversee the entire operation. I would make everybody call me burn boss, (laughs) Josh. Totally would. Um, Additionally, local fire departments volunteer personnel and sometimes equipment, uh, so they lend out their stuff, which is nice, and people, such as water trucks to assist. We also had quite a large number of park volunteers that go through our training and help on on the fire line as well. That'd be neat. I would do that. Yeah, on like a Saturday afternoon? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's different for each state and agency, um, but our burn bosses go through training put on by the state in order to get certified. Uh, I can't recall if this is mentioned, but another advantage of controlled burns is that the charred earth absorbs light because it's black in color uh, more than it normally would, causing the soil to heat more quickly and thus early germination for the desired species. I had not considered that. We didn't mention that. Good factoid there. Uh, Thanks for satisfying my wondering mind. Tracy Kump in Cincinnati, Ohio. Thanks a lot, Tracy. We appreciate that. Oh, we always love to hear from people who know what they're talking about. <laughs> Burn Boss Kump. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast or hang out with us on Instagram at SYSK Podcast. 
You can join us on facebook.com slash stuff you should know. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.